across the country. Everyday people have secured structural democracy reforms that have led to major wins that move our country forward. Our system is rigged in favor of the wealthy. These elites use their wealth to purchase political power and buy off politicians who will keep enacting policies that overwhelmingly benefit them and keep the rest of us from fully participating in our democracy. Sowing division is their main strategy for holding on to power. Now, it's easy to feel downtrodden as every aspect of our broken system is laid bare. As the country reels from the death of those like Breonna Taylor and Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the rights of millions of Americans hang in the balance, it feels more and more like the system is stacked against us. I've been working to overhaul our broken system for decades. I know firsthand how hard the struggle for true justice and equality is. My mother worked on it, my father worked on it, and those before them. Others led this struggle long before I came along. And I've tried to do what I can to link up with others and take up the baton of welfare rights workers and Martin Luther King Jr. and those who started the Poor People's Campaign to unite poor and working class Americans and demand bold policies that lift everyone out of poverty. At every turn, our movement for a moral revival has faced intense backlash from those in power. My faith tradition tells me we are not of those who shrink back unto destruction, but we are those who persevere unto the salvation of the soul. We cannot become cynics. We will not give up. Welcome, welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Fredos. In 1962, Tom Hayden and his colleagues in Students for the Democratic Society SDS, wrote what came to be known as the Port Huron Statement. They sought to organize and speak to a younger generation who matured in the post-war world. Port Huron argued that mankind desperately needed revolutionary leadership, yet it saw America immobilized in the national stalemate its goals ambiguous and tradition bound instead of informed and clear. Its democratic system apathetic and manipulated rather than of, by, and for the people. As Hayden put it, their work was guided by the sense that they may be the last generation in the experiment with living. It would be hard put to dispute that these same issues continue to fester in greater complexity and destructiveness, destructiveness today and demand change in even greater urgency than was the case over 60 years ago. Our guest today on the Radical Imagination is John Inazu, the Sally D. Danforth Distinguished Professor of Law and Religion at Washington University in St. Louis. He teaches criminal law, law and religion there, and writes and speaks frequently about First Amendment issues such as pluralism, assembly, free speech, religious freedom. His new book, Learning to Disagree, The Surprising Path to Navigating Differences with Empathy and Respect, is a groundbreaking work designed to help us deal with our increasingly divided and angry culture. Helping us to build new bridges with our neighbors, co-workers, and loved ones, and helping us find ways to live joyfully in a complex society. Tom Hayden and his Port Huron colleagues would be intrigued and interested in hearing and having, having a dialogue with John. We're fortunate and blessed to have him with him today on the radical imagination. We are. We're very excited. We're very blessed to have you here. Very interested in hearing what you have to say. And thank you so very, very much for being on the show. Jim, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be with you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I want to start off with asking you about your educational background, your training, both uh, you, you have a, a, a 
dual uh, professorship in religion and law. Now that's somewhat unusual. So how did you come to that situation? Yeah, so a pretty winding and non-obvious route. I actually majored in civil engineering when I was in college and quickly discovered I was not much of an engineer. So I went to law school as an escape route from engineering and uh, slowly discovered that I, I really liked thinking and practicing uh, law. And uh, and then after some years in practice, went back to graduate school, did my PhD in political theory. And, and that's where I really studied more theology. A fair amount of my coursework and dis dissertation work was in theology and political theology, uh, which, which plays into some of my uh, thinking and writing today. And then I, very fortunate to have ended up at Washington University, where I now have a joint appointment. I teach half-time in the law school and half-time in the John Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. So I get to engage with law students and undergraduates, talk about law, talk about religion. It's a ton of fun. Yeah, interesting, interesting, interesting. So you did your dissertation on political religious theory. You want to just explain that a little bit more? Sure. Well, and actually this ties in well with your opening quote about the SDS, because my core academic work is on the First Amendment's right of assembly and the the theoretical, legal, and historical understandings of the right of assembly. And out of assembly, we think often of protest, but assembly also covers re religious gatherings and religious groups. Think about the ecclesia, for example. And assembly has ties into all kinds of social movements, especially those that find themselves outside of the majority or outside of the consensus norms. And that's when civil liberties are at their most important. So as I was working on this uh, research in graduate school, delving into the right of assembly alongside that work, a lot of theology came into the mix. I was uh, one of my mentors and advisors was Stanley Hauerwas. And so we, we talked frequently about these connections between assembly and theology and how it all might cash out in our society. Now, not just about religious protests, but all kinds of protests as, as well, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And that's actually, for me, one of the fun parts about my work is that it puts me into conversation with a lot of people across the ideological spectrum. So I, I am sometimes advocating for and defending the rights of Christian student groups and other times it's labor protesters or Black Lives Matter. And to me, the fundamental right to gather and to protest and to be your own group on its own terms is so core to our democratic society and so often abused by people who either don't understand the law or are willfully trying to ignore it. And so the fun, but also the, I think the real responsibility of what I get to do is to help people advocate for the causes they care about, even when I don't agree with them. And, and often I don't, but I, I think this fundamental right to assembly is so critical to our society. You sound like a, an ACLU lawyer. <laughs> an old school ACLU lawyer, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, that gets us into all kinds of very interesting issues. Uh, but um, so let me ask you this. Um, well, I, I want to find out, first of all, Sally, uh, you are the Sally D. Danforth Distinguished Professor uh, at Washington University. Um, she's the wife of a previous senator from Missouri, Senator John Danforth. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. That's right. Okay. Tell our audience a little about John Danforth. And yeah, so, so Danforth, and, and they're both friends of mine, and I see them from time to time, and it's a real privilege to have them in my life. Senator Danforth was a, a long-term senator from Missouri. Before that, he was uh, the attorney general of the state. And as a U.S. senator, uh, was was really involved in a kind of lost art of political comp compromise, working across the aisle, working in relationship with people of another party without kind of demonizing the other party. He was a, 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 a kind of Republican that is, is very hard to find anymore these days. And in fact, has has recently expressed real concern with and, and distancing from a lot of Republican politics today. Uh, Senator Danforth was also uh, nominated and confirmed to be the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations by under President Bush. So had a role in, uh, in that regard. And, I, you know, I look at him and when I talk to him a lot, I, I just... I see a, a person who had convictions, had his politics for sure, 
but also cared about the people around him and wanted to work for common ground efforts and uh, and modeled those friendships with some of his political adversaries in a way that's a lot harder to find today. Absolutely. He's an Episcopal uh, priest, correct? Oh, that's right. Exactly. Yeah, he's an ordained Episcopal priest and, in fact, presided over Ronald Reagan's funeral, among other things. So is it fair to say, uh, I've read about him, he's, he's seen as a principal at what he is a principled conservative uh, politically. Would you? Yeah, I think that's how he described himself for sure. Yeah. Okay, and and that entails what um, fiscal responsibility, uh, limited government. Uh, now we're going to get into the arena of of in a sense fusion politics and talking to people in a respectful, polite way and bridging, uh, 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 you know, bridging gaps in our uh, uh, ideas and so on. But um, he, in a sense, uh, agreed. Uh, he would not be uh, welcomed so much in Donald Trump's uh, uh, campaign, would he? Oh, that's 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 very clear. That's right. And in fact, he's he's weighed in publicly and nationally about some of his concerns, not only for uh, Donald Trump, but also for the current senator of Missouri, Josh Hawley, who who actually at one time was a, a protege of of Senator Danforth's, but who has taken his campaign rhetoric and positions in a very different direction. And and Senator Danforth has has quite publicly said he's he's very disappointed and and a bit embarrassed about how his role in helping Senator Hawley come to power. Let me ask you a little bit, then we'll get on more to the issues of the book here. Was Dan Ford a big supporter of, of Clarence Thomas during that during the hearing? There? Wasn't that the case? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, so so Justice Thomas was one of Senator Dan Ford's assistant attorney generals. I mean, actually, it just as an interesting historical fact, when you go back and look at that state AG's office from years ago, it was, it was uh, Clarence Thomas and two other heavy hitters in Republican politics, uh, who both, I think, became U.S. senators, and they were all deputy AGs under Danforth at the time. So I, I think, uh, you know, Senator Danforth was and continues to be a, a very strong supporter of Justice Thomas, and, you know, that earns him some friends in some circles and some um, enemies in others. Yes, I would imagine so. Yes, yes. Um, well, let me bring in uh, an individual I, I, we mentioned mentioned before the show that you familiar with his work, Reverend William Barber, who is also uh, uh, located in, in North Carolina, uh, has been for many, many years, is now up at Yale Divinity School. But tell us a little about your ideas as it relates to politically and perhaps even um, theologically to Reverend Barber who has criticized at times some of the fundamental Christian right as having a distorted view of the scriptures and actually even hijacking that message and calling for a fusion politics, uh, which would again bring people together around common issues that they are often um, pitted against by politicians, by politicians. Uh, I, that was a sort of involved, maybe two or three questions there, but, <laughs> but, but, but take what you want from it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, hear you address some of that. Yeah, there's a lot in the question and a lot of different ways we could approach it. But I mean, so just maybe a couple top level observations. And I, I, I can't really speak to the specifics of Reverend Barber's platform or anything, anything that concrete. But I, I think generally speaking, a couple of points. And the first one I'm going to draw from a philosopher, Alistair McIntyre, to, to make the observation that with, within any religious tradition, there is an ongoing argument in, that, that is given uh, life by the people in that tradition about what the point of it is, what the values are, where it's going. And that's just, that's just a, a descriptive reality about any religious faith or any other uh, ideological tradition. And Christianity is no different. And so there's a very public and ongoing discussion about what the future of Christianity looks like in this country. And there are loud voices in many directions trying to claim 
what is the best and truest representation of that. There is alongside that, I think, in, in lots of recent books and articles diagnosing this, a recognition that a certain kind of conservative politics has taken over an element of the Christian tradition and that there are many people who seem more formed by and driven by their political convictions than their religious convictions. And you could generalize that claim and say that happens to lots of faiths in lots of directions. And that's true. But as a descriptive sociological matter, it's happening in much higher numbers with a conservative Christian right element in this country that seems motivated and formed more by politics than by religion in many instances. Now, if you ask some of those people, they'll say, no, 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 you've got it wrong. I'm motivated by faith. But when you when you look at some of what matters, that's not always very clear. Yeah. Wow. Well, that was a great answer. Now, it just raises all kinds of other questions and issues. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, different faiths have different orientations and different ways of interpretation and so on and so on. I think where Barber in particular is coming from, and people like Cornell West or Susanna Heschel, and some of those I guess you would call on the progressive left, um, they're rooted theologically in a prophetic tradition coming from the Hebrew scriptures. Now, which, as I'm sure you understand, I know uh, in Barber's case in particular, sort of the Cornell as well, emphasizes the need to address the issues of the poor, the disenfranchised, and which, again, within the, within the Jewish tradition, um, that is the focus more uh, in, the, in the Hebrew scriptures than any other issue. Be kind to the stranger. Um, love the other, for you are a stranger in a strange land. Now, the remnants of that viewpoint, as Barbara would put it, um, should be standing in the breach that there is this political, if you will, ideological truth that has to come out and be part of the larger community before there is the sort of peace and harmony the beloved community, if you will, that I think we all want very much. And, and, and your book, Learning to Disagree, which is absolutely terrific. Really, really enjoyed reading it. Um, and um, certainly Cornell West talks about this radical love, reaching out uh, to the other, listening to people. I've taught in prisons myself. Cornell has taught in prisons for 41 years. Listening to that, one of my dearest friends and colleagues, James, the psychiatrist, James Gilligan, um, over and over and over again says, listen to the narrative, listen to what people are saying. And as you say in, in the first chapter here, that's how you begin to learn empathy, correct? Now, again, I'm sorry, that was, that was maybe three or four questions there. Huh. Uh, no, this is, this uh, is... We're academics here, so we we get for, uh, I'll try to be less verbose, but I, there's so much I want to talk with you about because I find what you're, what you're grappling with, so so profoundly interesting, and so much part of what this show has been about, the radical imagination, and some of the people that I've had on, which I will also talk about with you. Yeah, no, I love that. I, I love the title of the show, and I, I love where you're going with these questions. I mean, certainly being able to listen, and listening is not just something you wake up and do. It's something you've got to practice and cultivate. So being a good listener is a, is a predicate to being empathetic and disagreeing well, for sure. Uh, now, part of that, you, you mentioned in the first part of your question, that uh, attention to the poor and the vulnerable, which is part of certainly the Hebrew tradition, but also, as you, as you alluded to, uh, core to the civil rights movement. It's, it predates that in the social gospel of Walter Rauschenbusch. It comes through Catholic liberation theology. And, you know, it, it, there are lots of intellectual strands we could draw from to talk about the importance of taking care of the poor and the vulnerable. And it's also it's clearly um, prioritized within Christian scriptures and Christian theology. Now, it, it, gets, it does get harder when you move from that principle. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. And Jesus himself, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, Jesus yeah, Jesus as, as, as uh, implicit in Christian theology. But 
when you move from the principle to what should the exact policy be, that's when you, you know, people have disagreements about that. But I would say as a, as a front end matter, someone who would say, Jesus doesn't care about the poor or Christianity shouldn't care about the vulnerable. That's just misstating a, a very core and clear part of Christian doctrine. So we should start with where that common ground is. And then when you get into specific policies, rather than starting with purity deaths, start with where you might find common ground objectives. And we, act, we actually have legislation today that, that provides a good example of where you can actually reach common ground. So for example, um, providing adequate leave for women after they've given birth to children in the workplace. That's a common ground issue that people on all sides can get uh, get around. And that and that helps people who are in more relatively more vulnerable situations. And, and we need to look for more of those examples and start there rather than start with the ideological purity tests that say, if you don't agree with me on this, all this lineup of exact policy prescriptions, then you are evil and dumb. Yeah, no, I, I really agree with you very, very much. However, <laughs> um, you know, in recent shows, I've had um, a, a Palestinian activist who was in an Israeli jail for 10 years, I think since he was 14 to 24. Um, he has joined now with some ex-Israeli soldiers to build a peace movement called Combatants for Peace. Um, I am just awed by the courage and the necessity for that sort of discussion. And it's a very difficult one that obviously you would imagine they would have. They've been doing this for, I think the organization is about 20 years old now, but to gain that trust, to, to, to at, at a one-to-one -one personal level to deal with it. You're absolutely right. Then we get into the policy, policies. It, we look for common ground there too. But the question is, what do you do with people who you just simply at, at the present moment can't deal with? <laughs> uh, and and on, on both sides, on all kinds of sides. And I, I've said this before a number of times on the show, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a supporter of Israel. I'm a supporter of the two state solution. I taught at Yeshiva university for over 10 years. I love teaching there. I, uh, sociologists, obviously there, but I do know there are religious and, and I've had one of my ex students on the show, Yishai Fleischer, who is now the international spokesman for uh, the Jewish community in Hebron, uh, and 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 they and argue about the issues of Zionism with uh, an Israeli progressive filmmaker. So my my point is, on both sides, you have certain religious, dogmatic, political, military elements within Hamas who are not interested in talking. Period. You have it on certain certain elements in the ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish community as well. How do you bridge the gap with these extremists? You, you, as you know, okay, so people on the Hamas, not all, not all, and not the majority, we're not saying the majority of Palestinians here, but they have captured the, the, the narrative in a sense and believe when you say river to the sea, it's all Palestine by Palestinians. When you look at on the other side, the Jewish fundamentalists, some of them will say, River to the sea, you got it, all Jews. What do you do? How does <laughs> right do you yeah. agree? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, talk about teeing up a really complex issue for me there. Um that's a it's a it's a hugely important question. I, I can't begin to give an answer to it uh way outside of my expertise. Let me let me make an analogy, though, to draw this a, a bit closer to home. There are people in this country right now who are so far on the right that they would say the people on the left don't deserve a voice and that, that you know, this country needs to be different and we're going to win at all costs. And there are people on the left who, who say that as well about the people on the right. And so there are 
in our country today, there are people who aren't interested in actually living in a diverse democracy. They're interested in winning at all costs and then crushing the other side. And frankly, those people are not the audience of my books or my speaking because they don't want to listen to me. What they want to do is win. And I'm much more interested in what I think is still a very large segment of this country that understands that politics is about compromise, that living in a diverse democracy means living alongside and even defending the rights of people who think quite differently than you do, uh, who advance different ideas of the good, and that in the ongoing conversation that we have to be having in a country like ours, the only way to keep doing that is to work toward compromise, work toward listening, and then allow people the right to engage and, and speak and, and persuade. That's, that itself is a pretty tall order right now in 2024. And uh, I think and I hope that there are enough people out there who, who still resonate with that message who aren't actually trying to win at all costs and for whom, frankly, politics is important, but is not everything that defines them. And I think putting politics in its proper place and recognizing that alongside the people who disagree with you are also people who have to eat, work, sleep, and pray, people who have joy and sorrow and emotions and hopes and dreams, that that's a pretty good start to reminding us of our shared humanity. It doesn't mean that we're, we're done with the evil people because there are people who are evil who are out there and we have to name and resist evil. But it is a caution against putting too many people in that category just because we happen to disagree with them. Amen. Although on the last sentence you brought in there, that's the social scientist coming in on of me here. Um, when you talk about deviance or criminality and so on, or working with James Gilligan, the psychiatrist, labeling people evil, good, in that moralistic sense, how far can we get with that sort of language. And, and, and Jim's point is working as he has for much of his life, working with uh, you know, citizens within prison. What he has found in listening to the story is that these are people who've been severely damaged. He talks a lot about humiliated, disrespected, uh, and so on. So punishing. You know, using terms like, and I'm not saying you are, retribution, punishment, uh, these are evil forces that need to be dealt with in some ways. It doesn't, see, it doesn't get us very far. I think what we need to see is uh, these issues as, as, as public health issues, perhaps, or, or legal issues that encourage people to get together, as you are trying to do in a very courageous way. Um, so I, I wonder, uh, do we, do we ever need to call people evil? Well, I, I, I don't want to give up on the term. I mean, I think when, when the, when the, when the white supremacists march in Charlottesville, that's a form of evil. And it's important to name that as evil. Now I would, I want to hold intention that every person marching there is also under my understanding of Christian theology, also an image bearer. And 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 um, you know, a fallen human being just like you and I are. So there's a there's a mix there. But but people can engage in very evil actions, I think, and it's important to to yeah. name those. Uh, your other point, though, I think gets into a, a very important aspect of what I try to discuss in my book, which is that this side of uh, eternity, we're stuck with systems of justice and fairness that are at best proximate and are at worst not even close. And so as we engage with and understand the system of justice around us, uh, administered by human actors, people are going to get it wrong. And there really is no ultimate fairness or justice that happens. Anytime a court acts or a law is enforced, we're just trying to get close. And I think the way that should remind us is to have a bit of grace for all of the actors in the system, including those who are sentenced under it, and to recognize that we're not dealing with science or, or math here. We're dealing with human lives and human actors, and uh, we can hope for a, a future justice where everything is righted. But until then, we're just we're, we're just stuck with a kind of proximate justice. Yeah, I, I'm glad you 
you know, you, you, you quali- not qualified, but you, you explain more that yes, you can hate the action, but that's different than hating the person. The person can be involved in hateful, evil actions, but we are all in, made in God's image and grace and so on. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. Um, it, it, um, what you're saying is real justice was, well, are you saying real justice, true justice will only really come about, as you say, on the other side, perhaps? Or, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, and we can, you can just illustrate this with a simple point. If, if you, you know, if you and I are together and you steal my iPhone, under the justice system, we can order you to give it back to me or to pay me money for it. But there's no there's no remedy there that fully rights the wrong that has occurred, right? I have still experienced in life broken trust with you and maybe broken trust in the larger society about the act that happened. And there's just no way ever to remedy the injustice that has been done. We can, we can attempt to uh, provide restitution. We can attempt to help people, but there are harms that happen and we're stuck with the unfinished and unfulfilled aims of justice. We can think of far harder examples than the theft of an iPhone that drive home that point. And uh, and so I, I mean, where you go with that, you could you you can and should keep working for proximate justice. That's important. I think depending on where your faith tradition is, you can hope for ultimate justice and pray for ultimate justice. And then there's the option of forgiveness, which, which in in very profound and radical ways. I mean the the title of this show, The Radical Imagination, boy, there's there's very little that is more radical and more imaginative than actual forgiveness in profound ways. And that is the one human act we can do that actually breaks the cycle of violence. It's not, it doesn't mean that it comes easily for everyone, but it, it is something that when it happens is, is really profound. Absolutely. And the belief in redemption and restorative justice and your 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 phone is is absolutely safe. I have an old fashioned one. I can barely understand this one. Uh, so do I. But here's a serious point I will make. As a kid, I was traveling around Europe and Middle East, and I ended up spending a month in an Israeli kibbutzim. And as with some of the other volunteers and so on, we we worked the fields and so on. And I remember one day. We had a meeting. Some of the, you know, the Israeli uh, whoever was in charge of the volunteers said, came in. I remember she came in and said, with a sort of a chuckle. She said, uh, I don't think it was a phone, but it was something was taken from somebody, a radio was taken from somebody's room. And she said, you know what? Listen, we're in an environment here, right? The, 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 the political you will religious ideologies you give what you can you get what you need all right if you want to call it modified socialism call what you want she said you don't need to steal we if you want to you want a radio just ask us you'll get it so isn't there something to be said about a society that has a certain amount of economic political moral intellectual justice where the crime rates, the rates of violence would be much less as a result. And we, we, we know that uh, the, the enormous inequality of wealth, Gilligan has pointed this out in his book, and then others over and over again, is the prime reason we are, why we have so much structural violence. So again, I, I know we've touched around here about, uh, talked around about these policies, but Policies do make a difference in people's lives and opportunities. Um, and, and the last thing I just want to point out here is, uh, I love the way Cornell puts it, justice is what love looks like in public. And I'd love to have your reaction to that. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I certainly don't disagree that we could do a lot better in a range of different policies. What those specifics are, you know, again, it's not my expertise. I don't want to weigh in certainly on a, okay. on a show right now. But I will say this. I, I think one of the best things we can do as citizens to educate ourselves around these issues is to find, start with whatever presumption we have on a certain policy. 
issue and then find the best possible argument in the other direction. Try to get our heads around how mm. those other people think in a way that would actually be recognizable to them. And then we're going to start to have really good disagreements and understandings about differences in beliefs and in baselines and in consequences. And, and I, that's sort of what one of the real hopes of better arguing, I think, is to come up with the, the ability to name and describe the other argument in a way that is intelligible to the other side. Because too often we just reinforce our own priors and we come up with straw man or caricatures of the other side. I don't I don't have an example to put this into practice with a concrete policy issue, but I just I would just say pick any issue, right? Go out there and look at the Pew data that the national polls that show how divided we are as a country on some of these issues. And then ask yourself, why is it that 45% of the country thinks differently than I do? And start with asking what's the best possible argument they're mustering, rather than what's the worst motives they might have. I couldn't agree with you more on that. I'm sure you do much of this in your classroom and, and you do get into it in your book. And I think that's what Student, uh, what, what professors really need to do, teachers all over need to establish this this uh, capacity for critical thinking and, and, and so on. Well, I have an issue for you, abortion. How do you get, we're not playing around here, we don't, you know, we have a limited amount of time, but how, how okay, so seriously, I buy everything that you're saying here. With people, how would you work with people who are on, opposite ends of that particular issue. How do you get them to begin to understand where the other person is coming from, the thinking and feeling? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll actually respond to that by sharing a story that Senator Danforth told me. We mentioned him earlier in this um, conversation, and he, he's a great example here. And, and he, I think in one of his earlier books, recounts the story in Missouri, I think even in St. Louis, where uh, a member, uh, I think it was a Catholic nun, got together with a leader in Planned Parenthood and, and they sat down and they said, you know what? We have very different views. This is maybe 20 years ago. We have very different views about the issue of abortion, but can we start with something we might agree on? And, and they, they got to a point of agreeing on some aspect of caring for children uh, and, and, and built some common ground around that. And, and here's, I think, there are a couple points here. One is you can actually find common ground, even with deep adversaries. But the other point is that in the doing of the work, the coming together in common ground efforts, you actually start to see that other person as a human being. And you see the, the skills and strengths and gifts of that person and not just someone who's the wrong side or the adversary. And so I, I think that it's not just the substance of the common ground work, but it's the ability to work alongside people who are quite different than us. And that's an, that's an example right out of the abortion context, which is one that divides us, you know, as deeply as any other. So it doesn't need to divide us as deeply as, 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 it, as it has. If we're able to deal with it at this one-on-one -on -one level too, to see that, that these are difficult choices that people are making uh, or not making. And right, is, that's, what, that's what you're trying to do here. Well, you know, I'll give you another sort of hard case example that I discuss in the book, a Masterpiece Cake Shop, which is the Supreme Court opinion about the, the gay couple that's getting married and the conservative Christian baker that doesn't want to bake a cake for the wedding. And, you know, as I as I walk through in the book, as a, as a purely legal constitutional matter, this is a hard case. There are lots of complex and competing legal doctrines. It's why you get it up to the Supreme Court and you have smart judges disagreeing with each other. Uh, but as a human matter, one of the things that really astounded me and, and uh, about the case as it was coming up in the media is just how unsympathetic each side was to the other. And so I would say a, a place to start is to say, if you are normatively siding with the baker, could you conceive that rather than a, a couple of activists, that this is actually a couple that is celebrating their big day? And this is deeply hurtful and shameful and harmful to them that they can't get the cake they wanted. And in the other direction, if you believe the couple should prevail here, could you not conceive that this conservative Christian might have a sincerely held belief that's way different than your own, that's motivating his actions, that it's not just bigotry and hatred of, of other people? And, and I think starting there with actual human beings is one way to soften some of the edges 
it doesn't mean we don't avoid the conflicts because the conflicts are inevitable, but it means we could start narrating, describing, and, and discussing these things quite differently. Well, let's go a little further with, with that Christian Baker there. Tell me what, okay, I get the idea that the gay couple is saying, you're being hurtful. This is a wonderful day. Why can't we, we love your cakes? We want to, what would be the Christian Baker's retort to that? Why not sell the cake to him or to them? Uh, I mean, the answer would be, so, I mean, the baker's position would be, this is a sincerely held belief that I I don't actually agree with the act that you're doing in this wedding, and I, I can't support it in my actions or my craft. And so if you, you know, and, and some people... I think struggle with well, what's what's the baker doing? It's just baking a cake. So if that's if that's not a, enough of an example, think about a wedding singer, right? Also, someone whose livelihood depends on being paid to engage in wedding-related activities. Is that person should that person be forced under the law to sing at a wedding that they don't agree with? You know, or in the other direction, if you think if you're unsympathetic to the couple when it comes to a cake, well, what about a bed and breakfast or a hotel? Should the hotel be able to say? I'm sorry, you can't get a room here. So, you know, the the challenge of cases like this is that there are limits to either side of an argument. And and but one of the opportunities when you push at those limits is to conjure up ideas and and maybe even an ounce of empathy about why this might actually matter to the person who's voicing the position. Yeah, I was going to say amen again. But um, what was the result of, of the, so the, the gay couple did not, wasn't able to get the cake. Was there any other firmer, uh, further ramifications about that? Wasn't there some sort of reconciliation or maybe maybe wishful thinking on my part? Yeah, I think that might be a, a, a happy ending that didn't actually play out in, in, in the news. Yeah, but that's again, we, we remain polarized. The right to boycott, we started our bizarre dialogue saying, you are in the forefront, you're a champion of people being able to, to protest and say what they want, they, they feel, as long as they're not inciting violence and so on. I, I, you know, and, and so here we are, try as you might, there might be people who are just simply not ready yet. And it seems like we need to bring in a psychiatrist too, because so much of this is, People need a, a therapeutic understanding of what it is that they're so fearful of. And I think, again, I'm pushing back on the policy stuff, that I think we can come up with policies that aren't, aren't rooted in vengeance and retribution and, again, punishment. Gilligan is not saying you let everybody out of prison. You restrain people, but to punish them is so counterproductive. And that's what prison has become. It's the place where you learn to become a better criminal. You're treated in a way where you're, you're even more polarized. So can't we begin to, on, on all sides, let's say the crime issue, understand that what we're doing to people, how we're responding, is making the problem worse. That's not to say people are shouldn't have to, uh, you know, responsibility for their actions and so on and so on. But understand that, uh, that society is in many, many ways making the problem worse and that we can come up with uh, solutions that are um, much more helpful and much more humane. And we need to talk about it and enact those policies too. Oh, for sure. And I, I don't have any disagreement that our current criminal justice system is deeply broken. And, you know, I, I think the, on this, uh, although politics complicates this, I, I, I don't see this as purely even a left-right issue. So just to mention a couple books that some of your listeners might be interested in, both of these from conservative Christians, one by the late Harvard law professor Bill Stunts, The Collapse of American Criminal Justice, and then a newer book by a lawyer in Washington, Matt Martin's Reforming Criminal Justice, A Christian Proposal. And so I think you know a lot of people are, are recognizing what has been a very long-standing and deeply embedded structural problem with our criminal justice system. Now, there are massive political hurdles still in the way to reform, and I don't know how to solve those, but I, I, I think it is worth mentioning that this 
this particular issue is becoming, and I hope increasingly becomes a, a bipartisan issue where where people recognize some of the the very harms that you've been naming. Yeah, um, if you can, just I, well, we've got we've got we're running beginning to run out of time here, but but can you give me one example from those two books you mentioned about um, a, a Christian proposal or policy? that they might be talking about in, the, in those books? Well, I think, I mean, both books emphasize the theme of not just not just the significance of law and justice, but also of grace and mercy. And, you know, so as, a, as an entry point, and you mentioned this earlier in our discussion, that having grace and mercy top of mind uh, really matters here. And then you can, you can get in specific proposals about police reform. That was most of Stunts' efforts. And then prison reform, which I believe what the Martins book focuses on more. Um, and there are... Lots of examples of where you can go. One of Stunts' points is we've really lost the local level of social trust in policing with the changes in who populates the police departments and where they live. You know, it used to be that the beat cop lived in the area and knew the neighbors, and that's just no longer the case. And that's a real problem to how we how this plays out into our laws and and different earlier versions of the penal system, not all of them good, right? I mean, it's, in some ways it's good we've come away from some of the older historical practices, but many of the motives that were toward rehabilitation and mercy and clemency are now devoid of, of some of our current systems. And I think both of these authors are advocating for more of that in our policy and, and consciousness. Yeah, I love the way you, you do this in the book here. Uh, you have each chapter uh, taking on a particular issue. Is forgiveness possible? Can we be friends? Can anything be neutral? Can we trust faith? Uh, I, I think that it's very, very helpful in, in, in getting our heads around uh, these specific issues and breaking it down more. I, I do have to mention, as I know you know, um, the original idea was, uh, well, the word, Penitentiary comes from penitence and well-meaning, very progressive thinkers of their day, the Quakers, were largely uh, behind that notion. They thought, wow, we're, we're trying to really help here and uh, get us away from the, the, you know, the punitive uh, aspect of this and, um, and, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, capital punishment, corporal punishment, and so on. And yet with with all that we've tried, we still seem to uh, be stuck in uh, a, a circle, um, a very vicious circle. And so again, um, I think what would be very helpful is for <laughs> your book to, to really have wide circulation within universities as well as uh, in the prison system, too. I, I think correction officers, the police need to hear this and talk about it. And, and as you say, on a local level, have these sorts of meetings together with aggrieved community members. I, I, I just did a show with a um, uh, young lady, Minerva Perez, um, a Latino woman who was working with the police out in East Hampton. And back to our phones again, she has provided the East Hampton police with special phones where they're able to then call um, some sort of Spanish translator so they can help uh, the police understand what's going on so things don't escalate. So uh, that's terrific. <laughs> that, that's, I think, where we need to go as well. No, that's a fantastic illustration. And again, you know, illust also emphasizing the point of trust when it comes to local networks and local institutions and, and trust building across difference or in, in unfamiliar settings is so key to a better understanding. And it doesn't happen overnight. You've got to build in time. You've got to build in systems. You have to build in relationships. Yeah. And I, I'm looking at the clock and we do have two or three more minutes and I, I don't want to leave us on, on this sort of note, but I do. Look, we've got about eight months to go in this campaign. I really, really wish your your perspective and method here can be embraced. With all due respect, you know it's not. 
going to be. We've got eight months of hell coming up with campaigns, with all kinds of accusations, with yelling and right. How do we buffer that? How do we protect ourselves? How do we survive all of this? What yeah, you- uh, it's a fair question. I mean, so let me let me say this. It's very unlikely that you're going to change people's votes in the next eight months, right? In, in other words, where we're headed is pretty baked in. And so, if your personal, not you, but if one's personal call is to, I've got to persuade my family member or my neighbor to vote differently, I think that's unlikely. And even if it did happen, it wouldn't really move the dial in, in the political process. So, what is coming it has been a long time in the making and is probably baked in. Uh, and what is coming is going to be very challenging because regardless of what happens in November, we are going to have, regardless of who wins, a contested election, a yeah. weak president-elect, all-time lows in journalism and media, and massive spread of false and misleading information through social media and AI. That is a recipe for uh, a disaster when it comes to social trust. And so if you're asking sort of what do you and I and other people do between now and then, I think we take small but concrete steps in building trust in our local institutions and our local environments, knowing that this is going to be hard. And rather than going in with false expectations of changing someone's mind about politics in eight months, can we work toward forming deeper and more meaningful human bridges with each other? Because we're going to need it. And there's going to be I think fear, anxiety, and uncertainty in the months to come. And and like you said, a lot of shouting. So let's start by being different people in our own interactions and uh, and and working toward those kinds of improvements. John, well, well put. I really, really agree with you. I wish you the best for this book. I also <laughs> I I want you to succeed very much, but if it's going to become number one, then we're really in trouble and, and we, we're needing you even more so. So I, it's a mixed message there. <laughs> I, I, this book needs to be read by all. Learning to disagree, the surprising path of navigating differences with empathy and respect. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, maybe we can lessen the blows here that, that are going to happen um, not only in the next eight months, but absolutely in the months and years to come. So thank you. Thank you, John. This has been great. I really yeah, it's, it's been great to talk to you. Thanks so much for the conversation. Thank you. thank you so much. Take care. And thank you all very much for viewing us and here again on the Radical Imagination. Jim Fredo is here. We'll see you again next week on the Radical Imagination.